of Rivers, the new address of River City Calvary Chapel up there. Can you do that? <clears throat> I'll take a little bit more mic, please. All right, guys, why don't we go ahead and take our seats, get our Bibles out. And um, you guys are going to help me to remember I have an opinion by somebody named Paul of where I left off last week, but I'm not sure that he's right. Where did I leave off? Did I leave off on chapter, uh, chapter 3, 14? Or did I get all the way through three and we're in four? Which one is it? Everybody for four, raise your hand. Everybody for three, raise your hand. Okay. All right. End of three. Okay. Well, look at how can we not go through this? Even if we did it once, we'll do it again. Uh, chapter three, verse 14. We're going to talk about this. This love. You think it was 19? Yes. <laughs> Is it 14? Okay, well, you're out. They're outvoted. The women are they're outvoting you, Red. <laughs> hey, <laughs> we got to do what they tell us, right? <laughs> anyway, how much the Lord loves us. The love of God. We're going to see. Paul is going to be praying uh, for us uh, about knowing the love of God and, and uh, that it's a continual process that will go on through the ages that we will learn more and more and more about the depths and the riches of God. And remember, his love is agape, right, in the Greek. It means a love that doesn't necessarily have any benefit in that love. There's nothing that you need to earn. There's no way you could earn it. It is freely given and it's unconditionally given, no matter how, how messed up we might be, <laughs> in my case, and uh, how many sins we might have or, or what, you know, what our skin color is. Like today, we see things that you know, people that are prejudiced today. God is not prejudiced, amen? There is there, and it's not about whether you're a male or a female. It's not about that. He loves you. He loves you, and I, I can tell you now, after 42 years of walking with the Lord, I can tell you that I'm, I'm learning. It's just blowing my mind how much more I'm learning about his love. And I, I think it's one of those things, we're his, uh, we're his little project to understand more and more because I think our faith can't really totally fathom how much and how deeply God loves us. And we've been seeing all that God has done for us. And we're going to go through a little bit of a list at the end of this about what Ephesians has told us about what God has done for us. Notice, our, in our position that is in Christ Jesus, where he has credited us with the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Not our own righteousness, because we didn't have it before the Lord. We failed. We all have sinned and all have fallen short of the glory of God. No matter how good of a person you are compared to me, no matter how wretched a person I am compared to you, our, our, we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We don't deserve the love of God, and yet he gives it to us, everybody. And so what a beautiful thing. He loves the prisoner. He loves the one that's in jail. He loves the one that is in the corporate office. He loves the one that is um, even over in Russia and all the people there and that maybe in the army or maybe the people that are even fighting in the Ukraine. He loves them. He loves the soldiers. He loves the office workers. He loves you. He loves the musicians. He loves you just the way you are, right in that place. He loves the people that hate him. And so we see this love that we can't really completely comprehend. Matter of fact, I believe we're just seeing the little surface of it right now. And so Paul prays for the Ephesians, 
probably at this time they were the they were the most mature church uh, in the Gentile churches. They were uh, an outstanding church, outstanding reputation, and their reputation was for good things. It was for their love for other people, their humility, that Christ likeness. And so Paul prays for a church that we would say, well, no, pray for the ones that are not doing well. Remember, we talked about this. When you see something that is going well and maybe someone that's really walking with the Lord, don't think, well, they don't need prayer. I'm going to just pray for the person that's not doing well or whatever. Hey, pray for all of them because Paul here prays for the Ephesians and it's a wonderful prayer. We pick it up in verse 14. Oh, and by the way, before I go do this, we are moving. We are getting out of this building, and we've got a wonderful new building that we're working on. It's at 9333 Tech Center Drive. It's a, it's Suite 2. Uh, no, that not 150, buddy. It's 200. Suite 200. And... Um, it is, uh, you'll see big signs over there. Uh, I think Thursday they're putting our, our electric signs up and everything in the front and the back. And um, after this Sunday, this Sunday we're still here, and then we are not going to have anything afterwards, our usual meal and that kind of stuff, but you can have some fellowship with us, especially you, uh, guys in, in maybe pulling up all the chairs and putting them there. Maybe we'll have a little party over at the new place. Who knows? We'll, coffee and donuts, yeah. That, but that's about it on that. We don't have our, that's all stuffed up with uh, uh, things. This Saturday, we're having a moving party. And so hopefully, we can move everything from the dining room over to the new facility uh, temporarily. So over there today, we saw the carpet starting to go in. We saw the ca old carpet removed. We saw the painting about halfway done on the inside, which is really good news to us. So it's it looks like it's you know, going the way we want it to go right now. Yeah. No Wednesday night service next week, okay? It'll just be too hard, okay? So uh, I may be in, uh, so just count on not having a Wednesday night service next week, um, and then we'll start it back up the following week, okay? This will be uh, the last one for this month. Well, for this reason, he says, verse 14, for what reason? Remember, always when you look at Scripture and it says something like this, answer the quote, wait a second, for what reason is he talking about? It will be in context there. And he even says in verse 3, for this re I mean in chapter 3, verse 1, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, for the sake of you Gentiles, for what reason? All of what he has been teaching you about who you are in Christ Jesus. And, and we saw so many different things that God has accepted you. Chapter 1, verse 6, we've been adopted as his sons uh, to the glorious grace in which he has freely given to you, us, to you in the one that he loves. In verse 1, 7, it says God has redeemed you. In him we have redemption through his blood. Beautiful things that that we have been redeemed and purchased away from the devil's power over us. And we've been released from that. We've been set free. Set free to live for righteousness rather than to live for sin. In verse 7 of, of chapter 1, he has forgiven our sins. In him, we have the redemption or the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. It's a beautiful thing. And in verse 9... He has made known to you the mystery of his will. And in his will is that he would make out of the two that he would remove the separating wall between the Jew and the Gentile. And he would make one new house, one new body, one new people in Christ Jesus. It's interesting when you go over to, uh, when you study the temple, the original way that God uh, formulated the temple, there was always a place for the unbelieving Gentile. Understand that? No other religion has a place for the unbeliever. But did you know the temple has that? It's called the court of the Gentiles. Now, the court of the Gentiles was the outermost court. 
And then there would be this gate, this wall that was there that would have a warning to the Gentiles. Nobody may enter into the court of the women. This was the Jewish women. Uh, could enter into that court without being killed for doing that. After that, the, after that, on the in the next wall would be the court of the men of the of the Jewish men, and then there would be the court of, of the priesthood, and then of course it goes all the way up to the place of the holy place and into the most holy place that where once a year uh, the high priest would offer the the sacrifice inside the holy of holies. And he's saying that barrier wall that says, you Gentiles, you can't go any farther, but you're welcome here. That, that wall has been removed in Christ Jesus. That we can come boldly before the throne because of what Christ has done for us. And so he has made to you known the mystery according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ and in verse 11 of chapter 1, it says, In him we were also chosen or made heirs, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in, conf in, the, in conformity with the purpose of his will. He chose us, man. Isn't that glorious? And he's not going to give up on us. He who began a good work in you will bring it on to completion. Isn't that awesome? And then notice... He has sealed you with his Holy Spirit, verse 13 of chapter 1. And, and we were included in Christ when we heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. And having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit. And he has made you alive together with Christ in, in chapter 2, verse 5. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, it is by grace that we were saved. And then in verse uh, 5 also, uh, well, of course, we talked about the grace already. Over in verse 6 of chapter 2, he has seated you in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So where he credits us to be and where indeed he sees us in reality because he is timeless and because of his omniscience and his omnipotence, he sees us seated in Christ at the right hand of God the Father, heirs of the, of the uh, uh, just a co-heirs with Christ Jesus of all the riches that God has given us. It's amazing. It's something that it's hard to sink in, how amazing that is. And that he's working in all of us to prepare us to accomplish his uh, eternal purposes in verse 10 of chapter 2. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which he prepared in advance for us to do. He's got a plan for our lives, and he's working that plan out. All these things that he's talking about, we've been brought near by the blood of Jesus, verse 13 of chapter 2. He has reconciled us to God in, in verse 16. In verse 18, he's given us access by the Spirit to God the Father. We can come to him. We don't have to be afraid of him or stay away from him, but we can actually relate to him as daddy, as God almighty, as papa, as Abba. And then he has made you a fellow citizen of the household of God, verse 19. And he indwells in you by his spirit in verse 22. Hey, a lot of reasons why. Do you understand? A lot of reasons why. And he's saying, notice, for these reasons or this reason, I kneel before the Father from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives his name. Notice he, he is humbling himself. He's, he's on his knees. Uh, there are people that stand and pray. Uh, I've seen instances in the book of, of, uh, book of Acts where Paul was standing as he is praying. Of course, in the Bible, you can stand and pray. You can sit and pray. You can be on your knees and pray. You can raise your hands in prayer, or you can keep your hands uh, down at your side. God's not a respecter of that. It's what's in your heart. And this stands, and in, in, it shows us an outward sign of humility of heart. He's on his knees praying. And notice who he's praying to. Who is it? 
What? I kneel before who? The Father. Okay, we got to go to uh, verse 14 there, Brad. Verse 14 of chapter 3. That's where we are. And so we have to, um, the reason, reason I kneel before the Father, notice the, the, the biblical formula, so to speak, if you want to call it a formula, but the, the order of, of prayer for the believer is that we, that we pray to God the Father through Jesus Christ. Okay? It's through Jesus Christ that we've gained access to God the Father. Now, it's not a legalistic thing where you can't pray to Jesus, you know, but that's not usually the way we get, you know, give God the glory. He's our Father. He's the one that is a Father to us, who loves us, who is generous, you know, that's that fatherly love. I want to talk to my Father. Do you understand? You know, you can pray to Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. And there's nothing wrong even praying to the Holy Spirit. But the normal way that we relate to God is to pray. And because we've been given access in the name of Jesus to God the Father. And that's why we normally might even say, in the name of Jesus, I pray at the end, right? Because he's the name and the authority that we've been given to talk to God the Father. Understand? So for this reason, I kneel before the Father and from, his whole, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth derives its name. This whole company, this whole family in heaven, who is that? We have the angels, the holy angels that God has created. We have all the believers that are in heaven right now, all the born-again believers and uh, here we see also that's going to be us. We, de- we will derive our name from him. We will take on his name. And uh, what a glorious thing that is to have his name upon us. I don't know, girls, you guys experience that a little bit in a non-glorified way. When you marry a, guy, a man, you take his name, right? And I, I think that's kind of, I think most women that I've met, they like that. There's a few women I know that, won't uh, take their husband's name, and uh, that's okay, but, uh, you know, I think it's something usually that is very romantic and very uh, honoring uh, to take the name of your husband. Well, you're going to have the name of God, and you're going to derive, uh, derive your name from it. And I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. Your inner being. All of us have an inner being. Some uh, King James calls it the inner man, but it doesn't, it's not just men, it's women also. I like this translation better, your inner being. That, that it would be built up, that uh, through God's power, uh, you know, he says, you know, through his power, his, in his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being. How we need that today. Because, you know, a lot, a lot of people, a lot of Christians, they, they do okay as long as everything's going okay. <laughs> and then when something's not going okay, all of a sudden they're gone from church. That's their reaction to hard times is they leave church or they stumble or, you know, they, they, they're not taking advantage of the church and, and the body. And that's what the devil does. He tries to separate you from the family of God when you're going through hard things. And then he tries, of course, ultimately to separate you from Jesus. And, uh, you know, that's the thing that we've got to watch out. When we're strong in our inner being, we realize, hey, I'm going to come here and I'm going to ask for prayer. I'm going to come here and share with my brothers and sisters my burden so they can share that burden with me and encourage me. That's where I I run to the church when I'm having trouble. I don't want to not come to church. But there's so many in the church today that 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 run away from fellowship and and sometimes they're embarrassed, they've got pride. They wanted to I guess they don't want to appear to have trouble like everybody else does. And uh it's too bad. And the devil rips them off. And so he's praying for them to have more and more strength in their inner 
uh, in their inner being, the spirit, in your inner being, so that Christ may, notice, dwell in your hearts through faith. Well, I thought he already does dwell in our hearts if you're born again. The, the Greek there is means that that word to dwell means that God, that Jesus would make his home in our hearts. He would settle down in our hearts. It's, it's not an effort of Jesus. It's, a, it's our effort that we would make him at home in our hearts. You know what I mean? Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, remember these people were being persecuted mightily, physically persecuted. Uh, you know, loved ones were being killed for the sake of Christ. And so when we put that into context, we don't experience that here yet, but that is where they were, they are. It's a whole different bag. And so he's praying that, you know, that he would have power through his spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts, make himself at home to, to really invite in, 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 in dwell with Jesus Christ in your hearts through faith. Notice it's always by faith. When a, when a thought comes in your head, a, a thought of doing good about a certain situation, or you see somebody that, that the Lord, uh, you know, it's just a word in your, in your inner being. Hey, go speak to them, love. Go tell them about me. Hey, remember that person? Go apologize to them and say you're sorry for what you did. That's Jesus speaking to you. He's dwelling in your heart, and he's, and he's wanting you to, he wants to live his life through you. And he'll tell you things. Now, if, if, he, if, if that inner voice is saying, hey, steal that thing in the store, you know, go steal that. Don't pay for it. Well, <laughs> or, you know, go out and, uh, you know, go get drunk tonight down at the bar and hang, you know, do these things. Obviously, that's not the voice of Christ, is it? And so what are we to do when we, when we believe something is in our hearts? What are we to do? We are to test, test all things by the word of God, okay? Always test, because there's some wild things that Christians come up with that they think the Lord's telling them to do. And if they would just really, wait a second, compare that to what scriptures say, uh, they would see right then and there if they tested it, that's not of God, okay? And so we, as he dwells in our hearts through faith, hey, we've got to live by faith, you see? We've got to take up God on that. I think a lot of times we just say, oh, that's just my imagination, or maybe that's just me thinking a thought. I don't know where that thought came from. Uh, you know what? We need to live by faith. What's it going to hurt you? It's not going to hurt anything. And, and you'll see that God will, will speak more to you if you're listening and, and you're obeying that. And so he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you being rooted and established in what? Love. The love of Christ. Anyone in 1 John, it says, anyone who says, I love God, but does not love the ones that God loves is a liar. And the truth is not in him. Do you love the people in this church? Do you love the, the brothers and the sisters? And when I say love, remember, chap, what is it? Chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians. What is love? <laughs> you know, L love has a whole bunch. It's love and work clothes that he's talking about. It's not just a, an emotion. It's, it's, a, it's a, it is a commitment. It is a valuation of other people. It is the way that you view them in your life, and it's a humbling of yourself in a doing of certain things. What is love? Read that over uh, in, uh, in your uh, quiet times. Am I doing that with someone? Am I being uh, pa patient and kind to them? Uh, am I being generous with them? Am I believing and trusting them? So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp. Now, what is he saying? This beautiful description of the love of Christ. He's saying, be rooted. I, I'm praying that you, in your strengthening in your inner man so that you become rooted and grounded in his love. So then, 
you can know more about what? The heights and the depths and the width of God's love. And so it's showing you that as you learn more uh, about God's love and you put it into practice, more will be added unto you. And, and so here we need to be rooted and established in love and in, in the love of God for us and the love of Christ for us. And we're established in it. We're walking in it that you again would be given power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. When you kind of draw that out in the air, height, depth, width, what does that look like? It's always when God describes in the New Testament the love that he has for you, he points to the cross. He always points to the cross. And he's saying, you know what? <laughs> you might help be able to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and know that this love that surpasses knowledge. Well, wait a second. You said, I thought you said that we might be able to grasp. And so we can grasp and we can enjoy, but we won't ever probably get to the bottom of really understanding and experiencing all of what God has for us in his love. It is deeper than any problem that we could ever have. It is higher than uh, the heavens right now. It is wider and more encompassing than anyone could ever uh, understand. From the, as the east is from the west, so it's his love for us and his forgiveness for us. And I just think about how, you know, we talk a lot about uh, today being, uh, what's the word? That we need to be inclusive, right? Inclusive is a big thing for social justice today. Man, oh man, is God's love inclusive? Sure is. It sure is, man. There is nobody, nobody outside of his love, no matter what they've done, no matter how they're acting. And, and it's one of those things as we view others as, you know, this is God's child. This Jesus died for that jerk, right? And the guy that just flipped me off, the guy that's on TV that's a, a, a jokester or a tricker or a, some kind of a politician who's lying or whatever, and we just kind of want to hate them, that Jesus died for them. Jesus loves them. He died indeed for the sins of the whole world. I think I need to have a better attitude about them, right? Not one that hates them, not one that is angry with them, not one that retaliates against them. This was the one that Jesus bled for, just like he bled for me. And so now unto him who is, I'm sorry, go on back up there one more time through verse 18, that you may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and how long and how high and how deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. You know, we think about this all the time. I had a very, very wonderful, he's like a second like a son to me, uh, a kid that grew up in my home, staying there, feeding them, all this stuff. He was a wonderful child of God, even early. I think he went to probably went to Israel at least four times with his parents, and he knew the Bible. He knew the Lord. His name was, uh, uh, well, I won't say his name. Jansen was his name. And uh, 18 years old just tearing it up for the Lord, just really good. And he was in his college group. Um, he was in college in Hawaii. And, um, you know, the college group went out to go see a movie, and he was sitting there with a couple guys, and he said, hey, I'm going to go to the bathroom. I, I, I don't feel good. And so he went into the restroom, and this was right around uh, New Year's with all the fireworks over there. 
He went into the bathroom, and after 20 minutes, finally, the guys went to go look for him, and he was dead. And he was only 18 years old, and he um, had died of uh, a, uh, from asthma. And um, I did his funeral, and there was probably a 1,000 people at his funeral. Not that that means necessarily something, but with him, it did. So many people, so many people that were affected by him, that had let, he had led to the Lord. We didn't know about all these things came uh, came out, and, uh, you know, we think about, God, Lord, why? You know, why would you allow that to happen? Guys, that's all hidden in the depth of his love. It's in the depth of his love. We won't know. We, would, we don't understand God's ways. We don't understand how deep his love is for us and what he's doing inside of that love. We can't comprehend it. We're, we're we're lightweights compared to him. Friend of mine was an assistant pastor, Barry Filer, <laughs> and we were we became very very good friends. He got he was a young man. He was about twenty two when he got diagnosed with leukemia, advanced, and it was um, he was told there's no hope. And uh, he lasted about four years after that diagnosis and. We became very, very close friends, and he lived that day as he became closer and closer to death. He, I remember the last night that I talked to him. Well, let me go back a little bit on this story. After a couple of years, he had taken all the chemo and done all the stuff that the doctors say, and he was very fragile. His liver was fragile. His organs were fragile, and he couldn't sleep. And about 12 midnight, he went across the street to... Uh, a, base, a, a, a basketball court that's at a school right by us. He lived up in Chico. You know, it's hardly anybody in that city. And he went up there to Chico, and he's playing, uh, throwing some rain, uh, basketball. And these two men with their shirt tails out, uh, as he's walking back, they jumped him, and they beat him really bad. They were beating him down. They were policemen undercover policemen that were looking for somebody that met his description and they were taking making their little move to bring justice you know hard justice to a criminal and he's crying out and his wife comes to the door and she says stop stop you're killing him you're killing him his his uh, organs are all messed up he's a he's he's uh you know he's he's got this disease and he's and they stopped finally but they had uh, caused him, they had to take him into uh, critical care. For, he was in the hospital for six months. He had lost much of his uh, immediate memory, his memory of, of over the past, you know, like months. And uh, he had had three kids during that time of four years because <laughs> uh, they didn't have any kids. He wanted to leave her ki with children and stuff, his wife. And um, anyway, when he came to and he was cognizant, the police chief came with a big thing of roses to his bedside. And, uh, and he, you know, was really sorry, obviously, but uh, very scared because this, he's got a whopper of a lawsuit there, right? Um, and uh, Barry told him, he says, uh, I want you to know, sir, I... I forgive you, I forgive your, you know, your detectives and everything, but I'd like them to come here and I'd like to tell them about Jesus Christ. I want to tell them, and I'm not going to sue you. And um, he didn't, and he ended up leading this captain to the Lord, and a couple of lieutenants came to his, uh, that were in this uh, group of undercover, they came to his funeral, all of them, and a lot of the police department came to his funeral and professed Christ uh, and, and received Christ that time. It's amazing, you know, the love of God that is so deep in these hurtful things that we don't understand why. It's hidden in Christ. It's hidden in the depth of his love. And we'll, fi we'll find out. We'll find out one day exactly God's plan, but we don't know it. His ways are truly not our ways. And uh, so now, he says, 
Verse 20, now to him who is able. Oh, I wanted to tell you with Barry. <laughs> he was always praying for me. And he was pretty much 24 hours in ministry. I mean, he was constantly out talking to people about the Lord, leading people to the Lord, ministering to his friends. And uh, I talked to him the night before he died. And I said, hey, Barry, how are you? And he said, oh, man, I'm okay, I'm okay. Uh, and he wanted to know more about me and my situation and stuff and uh, always wanting to pray for me. But um, he said, Mike, I'll tell you what. I've never, ever experienced the amount of holiness that I'm experiencing now. And he wasn't saying, oh, I'm so good and I'm so good. As he drew closer to being with Jesus, he was living in a, in a way that the sin in the world were nothing to him anymore. And it was becoming more and more that, that Christ engulfed all of his all of his desires all of his thoughts all of his motives and he was just telling me man I, it's just so glorious man i'm just getting a picture of heaven what it's going to be like when i go to be with him i'm seeing it already in my life and he told me about um you know not again not bragging if you can understand what i'm talking about he's getting so close to heaven that he's becoming like he, he will be in heaven and it was just a glorious thing. I, we didn't know he was going to die the next day, but he did. Uh, he did indeed die. God's love. It's hard to understand it. Some would just say, I hate God. I had a friend that I tried to lead to the Lord. He's a wonderful jazz pianist. And, and uh, he finally got ticked off at me at a job. And he started with tears in his eyes shouting at me. You know, how much he hates God because his mother died of cancer. And she suffered with cancer before she died. And that was his basis. And I don't, I have no knowledge of him ever changing his opinion of that. He was an atheist because of that. And it's just, you can get to that place where you go no further because there's no faith, you see. This is all by faith. We see these things going on and we say, I don't get what God's doing, but by faith, I know who he is. I, I know who he is. He's perfect love. He's perfect justice, right? We know those things fall back on the things that we know about God. But the atheist or the, or the unbeliever doesn't have faith and they'll, they'll accuse God. They'll be angry at God, all these things, and they'll reject God over these kind of areas. But one day we will find out uh, what it is that God did. And so sometimes when you're comforting somebody, when something really outrageous has happened where it's just, you know, like some of these situations I've been telling you about, don't feel that you've got to go to them and tell them what the purposes of God were in that. That's something that really can be upsetting to that person. It's not comforting at all. What they need you to do is wrap your arms around them and love them and cry with them and pray for them. But don't go in there interpreting what God's reason for was for this or why this was happening and all that stuff. That's not comforting them at all. And it's a bunch of stuff that you don't even know. It could be lies that you're telling them. So that's what I would suggest to you. It's hard to know some of these things. Uh, in him and through faith in him, verse uh, 12, in him and through faith in him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. And I ask you, therefore, do not be discouraged because of my sufferings for you, which are for your glory. You know, I just went, before it, didn't I? Oh, my Lord. I'm terrible. I can't see a darn thing. My eyes are so bad. Okay, forget what I, forget I just even did that. Okay, verse 20. Now, now to him who is able. Ooh, I love that. There's so many places where it says God is able, God is able, God is able. Even Abraham, where in Romans chapter 4, where it talks about, hey, he when he, you know, God said, you're going to have, you're going to be a father of nations. And here he is, he's 90 years old. His wife is about the same age, 
They're so past that. He, it, it says that he was aware of those things, but he knew that God was able, right, to do what he said he would do. And so he believed in God, and he trusted God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. And that's where we need to be, guys, in this whole thing that's going on. He says, now unto him who is able to do, notice, immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. According to his power that is work within us, he is able to do immeasurably more. Notice he is able, but that doesn't mean that he will. There's a teaching, of course, that we see all the time where you name it and claim it and you tell God and you put, he's like a vending machine, you put in the dollar fifty for, and you pull that candy bar you out. He's got to give it to you. Blab it and grab it, whatever you want to call it. It's God's will for you to be wealthy, so just imagine it into being, you know, your tush going down in the leather seat of the Mercedes, or maybe Rolls Royce, ooh, got an RR on the back. You just imagine it into being. That's witchcraft, what they're teaching. It's terrible. God is not our servant. He's not our vending machine where we put in the coin of faith and we pull his arm and get what we want. God allows sickness. God allows Christians to die. God allows, he heals. He does things that he wants to do. He does miracles when he wants to do it, but other times he doesn't do miracles. And we can pray. I had a friend of mine that many years ago, Again, beautiful couple, they love the Lord, they're going to a Calvary chapel I was at, and then they moved up north, up by Seattle, and they got into one of these churches that, that believe that it's all by faith, and that it's God's will for everyone to be healthy, never sick. And so he came down with this lump on his neck, big lump on his neck, and they told him, don't go to the doctor, claim it. God will heal it, and they did all their whoop, whoop, whoop over them and did all that stuff, anointed them, did all their stuff. It's getting bigger. He says, well, you don't have enough faith. Or maybe it's your wife that doesn't have enough faith. And so they got on her case, and she got all guilty, and she's like praying like crazy and crying and all this stuff. Then he's, he's starting to break down. It's come way more severe. So then what they tell him, well, it's got to be your children. Little children that don't have enough faith for daddy. And so she, mom goes and, you know, uh, you know, chastises her children. Daddy's dying because you don't have faith. Totally destructive. This is what's coming out of these churches. He finally went to the doctor. It was too late. If he had gone to the doctor, they could have quite possibly healed him, but he was way gone by the time he went to the doctor, and he died. And that family was destroyed. Their faith in God was destroyed by these people. And these are the people, they got millions and millions of dollars flowing into their church, and they're on TV, and they're just whipping out all these things. It's sad, isn't it? It's sickening. Hey, be careful. God will answer prayers according to his will, we're told in 1 John. Now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more in all that we ask or imagine, uh, according to his power that is at work within us, that same resurrection power, to him be glory. Make sure that your prayer is in line with that when you pray that your motive behind it is not for you to get the glory, for you to profit, but that Jesus would be glorified one way or the other. To him be glory in the church <laughs> and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And that's where we're going to stop tonight because I didn't teach that last week, did I? Okay, I believe you. <laughs> God is good, isn't he? 
Look what he's done for us, guys. Look what he's done. Look what he's doing. As we move to this new building, it's going to be an instrument, a tool that God is going to richly bless and, and powerfully use us. I really do believe that. And so I'm looking forward to that. I hope that you can come, all you guys that can come, will come on Saturday. If that is changed, if something comes up where it would mess that plan up, I will be sending out a phone call to all of you guys, and it'll hit all your phones. So, But uh, we're going to be uh, going for it. I'm going to have a moving truck, and we're going to move some stuff on, on over there. Okay? 8 o'clock a.m. Well, no, let's do nah, let's. I like the night. If you knew my daughter, that's how she thinks because that's how she lives. She'll st- <laughs> she'll go all into the into the uh, evening. <laughs> anyway, God bless you, Lord. We just thank you so much for your love for us, Lord. We thank you so much. How deep it is. Lord, we want to be rooted and established in our love. Lord, help us to walk in love, walk in faith. Help us to, to listen to you and what you're saying to us, Lord, and to act upon those things. And Lord, thank you for all that you're doing in this church, and we ask for you to bless each and every one here. Lord, help us to be stronger and stronger. Help us to be a greater light more and more in you. But we thank you for the great grace that you've given us the great mercy that you have given us. It will never end. And we thank you for that promise. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. God bless you.